into the bedroom and my mom says now y'all just keep eating and she gets up just calm like she is and she walks into the bedroom and there dad and mom begin to talk and, and don't know the conversation about how that goes back and forth but ultimately dad comes back out and he sits down and, and uh, he's sitting there and I don't know what triggered this but my dad looks at my mom and says you're just taking his side alright now most of us guys in here, we sort of can identify with this idea of, well, my son did this. I was trying to teach my son a lesson. Mama steps in and makes me be nice to him. Don't like that. And so most, most dads can identify with that. 
Only my mom didn't quite receive what he said the same way that I think he expected her to receive it. But my mama then gets up and takes her plate, and I'm not kidding you, zings it, food and all, across the room, and it hits this wall and shatters. And I looked over at my brother, and I thought, what just happened? Because I just saw something in my mom I had never seen before. She looked over at my dad and said, and I quote, I have raised these kids. I have raised these kids the best that I can. I am here every day with them while you're off at work. And I'm here to tell you, you're, uh, you're going to work and you're doing this and you're doing that. But I'm here to tell you, you will not tell me how to raise our kids. And guess what dad did? He shut up. Now, you may sit there and think, Tim, that's crazy. Uh, you know, that, that's just couple stuff. Uh, folks, you don't understand. I have never seen that before in my life. That was the one and only time I've ever seen it. And, and just to let you know, if you ever bring it up, the rest of us sort of scatter and pray that Mom forgets about it because we're not sure she's still over fussing at Dad yet. We just won't touch it. What happened? You hadn't seen nothing Yet, the wrath that finally came forth was a wrath that we had not seen. It wasn't a wrath that we had expected. It wasn't a wrath that was calm or tempered. This was a wrath that was pure and it was unleashed. And it's in that light that we get to Revelation chapter 15 and we're going to read about this wrath, this unveiling of the wrath. And what we need to understand tonight is this. We have seen a patient, loving God all the way up to Revelation chapter 15 and going forward over the next three and a half years of the tribulation, the last three and a half years, we are going to see the wrath of God unfold. And there's going to be a part in here that I want you to grab special note of. It says that literally no one was able to enter into the part of the temple where God resides there in no one was able to enter into that until all the wrath was poured out. You say, Tim, why is that important to remember? Well, if you remember going back to the book of Exodus, whenever the people of Israel needed to repent or to ask for forgiveness or to receive God's mercy and grace, they would enter into this this temple and they would there go before God and they would ask God to come down and meet with them and there they would they would literally offer sacrifices and other things so that there might be forgiveness, that there might be mercy, so that there might be grace. When we read these passages of Scripture for the next three and a half years, there's no more calling upon God for mercy and grace. That day has passed. What we are going to read about in, in this passage of Scripture is literally the unfurling, and, and of course we'll see this in the next few chapters, the unfurling of God's wrath. Say that to say this. If you're here tonight and you're lost, there is a way for you to miss out on experiencing and being a part of any of that wrath as it's poured out on this world. And that's to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. And as we read this passage of Scripture tonight, I want you to know that as a church, we are commissioned to go and to reach as many lost people as we can reach while the time is still ripe and while the opportunity is still here, we are to reach out and, and to try and save or to, to reach as many lost people as we can so they'll get saved so that they don't ever have to experience this wrath of God that's going to be unleashed. And here's the thing. If Jesus were to come today, this all takes place three and a half years from now for the next three and a half years. Now that ought to put it into perspective for us, shouldn't it? Do you realize that if you have a loved one that's lost today, three and a half years from now, God would begin pouring out his wrath, and if that loved one was here and was lost, then obviously they would be experiencing that wrath. I sometimes think that we as churches forget just how important it is to remember God's wrath, and so I want to take this back before we even begin reading I want to take us back and, and reflect on some of the things 
that God did in the Old Testament to show his wrath. Anybody remember the story of Noah? What happened in the story of Noah? What did God do? He literally destroyed the world with water because of the evilness of the earth, right? Those that were on the ark were spared. Everybody else perished. You also had literally, uh, during the times of uh, Abraham, a place, two places actually called Sodom and Gomorrah. And fire and brimstone rained down. And in fact, we read the story about Lot and his wife and how that Lot's wife looked back and turned to the pillar of salt. You see, sometimes we just assume that God is all love and mercy and grace. And don't get me wrong, that is the message for the world today. He is love and mercy and grace, and he wants to give that mercy and grace to everybody who will receive him as their Savior. But there's also a righteous God. He is also righteous in what he does. And there's a time where his righteous wrath will pour out. And if we don't reflect on this wrath of righteousness and how evil we really are, we're going to miss this whole story of what God is trying to do, which is today tell us that there's still opportunity for lost people to be saved so they don't ever have to experience this time frame. Now let's look together, if you would, uh, Revelation chapter 15. We're going to begin reading with verse 1. The Bible says, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God, or literally saying the whole completeness of God's wrath is right there. In verse 2 it says, And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for their judgments are made manifest. Now I want to stop there for just a moment and ask you this. When it talks about singing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb, who's that talking about? Those folks that are singing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Well, it's not just, uh, it, this particular part, I believe, is actually talking about the 144,000 Jews in particular. Uh, I do believe the Song of the Lamb is truly about the, uh, the saints. But the Song of Moses was about the, the captivity where they came out of uh, Egypt and they crossed the river. And, and so there was this song that they sang, and it's this idea of the Jewish tribes of Israel being uh, again, set free, if you would. If you're singing the song of Moses, the deliverance of God for, for the Jewish people, and you're singing the song of the Lamb, which means, obviously, salvation, what we're talking about here are 144,000 Jewish people that have seen that Jesus Christ is the answer, that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, that Jesus Christ is the Savior, and that because of their, their heart conversion, because of how that they've turned their heart over to him and have been forgiven, they can now sing this song. But I want you to realize what it's saying. It's saying that these are the people that conquered literally all that the Antichrist, all that the, the dragon, all that was thrown at them, they've overcome. Uh, with that being said, look at the next verse. It says in verse 5, And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials, full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. Now listen to verse 8. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. And as we read that passage of scripture, I want you to understand when it talks about this wrath of God, the fullness of the wrath of God, I, 
how would you uh, how would you compare that to something going on today? What what would you compare God's wrath to to something that may even be taking place uh, in our in our world today? What do you think? What did we just go through? Do I the pandemic? I, I certainly it created chaos. It's created all kinds of uh, uneasiness when it comes to the financial markets. It's changed governments, and it's changed the way governments operate. It's changed people. It's it's made enemies out of friends. It, it, I mean, it has created chaos. And that's just one little thing. Imagine what's going to happen when all of a sudden God pours out his wrath through these seven plagues. What are we going to be looking at then? Now, We've already seen all that has taken place all the way up till now, and it's not even the big, big culmination of it all yet. There's still more to come, and we're going to see that. There's so much more left to be poured out. Why? What is its reason? Why are we waiting till now to see the true wrath of God, and why is it wrapped up in these last seven plagues? Why, why would you not have thought... The first three and a half years of the tribulation would not be those things. What do you think? I think it's still mercy. Still mercy and grace? Which certainly. And, and uh, no doubt, probably, uh, I would assume, as I'm reading it, I have the confidence to believe that people were being saved. Yeah. What else? What has most likely taken place by this time? Three and a half years out, what has most likely been taking place? Any of these seven maps, these are being poured out on the people that failed to accept God in chapter 14. Uh, that, was, that was a pile of what they had in chapter, what, chapter 9. Mm -hmm. That was a pile and an overview of what's fixing to take place in chapter 15 is an overview of what's fixing to happen in 16. Exactly. These tribulation saints, when these, these are the ones that lost their lives and didn't take the mark of the beast, that's Gentiles that didn't take that mark of the beast. It was also, I read, the 144,000 that they were lost. Well, they and were in chapter 14, like it's back in chapter 7. And in 14, you have that pile of people that read it as a pile of I would agree with that, and I'll tell you why I agree with that. It doesn't limit it to 144,000. Um, the only reason that I say that is as we go on, we'll see that 144,000 resurface again as a new... But this this is so much more than just 144,000. What, what I was talking about was that Song of Moses. The Song of the Lamb is the one that encompasses all the other folks that go along with that. And just to give you an idea, do y'all remember a passage of scripture uh, in the New Testament that talks about uh, blessed is the one that gives someone who thirsts just to that cup of water? And I'm trying to think of where that's found and exactly how it says it, but 
but how blessed is that person who gives someone that, that sip of water or that cup of water. Have, have you ever really thought about why that says that and what is meant by that? What happens if you're in the tribulation and let's say I come to you and I can't buy anything and I can't get anything because I'm a child of God, I'm a saint of God, and I ask you for a glass of water and you give it to me? What happens to you? This being during the group of tribulation. And what would the dragon do to you if he found out you gave a Christian something to drink. Remember, I'm not allowed to buy. I'm not allowed to have. And now here you've given it to me. That makes you, to the, to the dragon, the same as me, right? You become an enemy of the dragon. And we read that as almost a prophecy in, in the New Testament of saying, there's going to come a day that just doing something simple and kind as far as just offering a drink of water to someone else could mean your very life as well as the life of the person you give the water to. And when, when we're talking, and, and as, uh, as we talked about this mark of the beast, where I was going just a moment ago is this. At this point, you either take the mark of the beast or you've not. I mean, at this point, you're either on one side or you're on the other. And I hear a lot of people sit there and say, well, I'm not going to make a choice. You, you know, we have an invitation on Sunday morning, and, and some people will leave saying, well, I just didn't make a choice. Well, no, you made a choice. You made a choice. You might not have made the right choice, but you made a choice. When you were here and God was knocking on your heart and, and telling you something to do, and you don't do it, you just chose not to do what God told you to do. Or, if you did it and you followed through, then you chose to obey and do what God told you. But there's not this idea, and I don't know why we grab hold of this idea that, that there's a choice to do, there's a choice to not do, or there's a choice that you just don't choose. That's not a choice. You either do or you don't. You either are obedient or you're not. Uh, sort of like uh, the saying used to be, you're either pregnant or you're not. It's one or the other. You don't get to just be in the middle. And by this point in time, when we get to this point in time of these vials being poured out and over the next three and a half years, God's judgment being poured out, you've already made your choice. You chose either to follow after the dragon or you chose to follow after God. And whatever is, is in front of you, you have already chosen. Um, when we talk about making a choice to, to turn to God before it's everlasting too late. I want you to understand what that means. Sometimes we say that and, and people are like, well, I can put it off till next Sunday, or I can put it off till next Sunday, or I can put it off till next Sunday. Well, at some point in time, either A, you're going to leave this world, now it's too late, or B, you're going to put it off and put it off till you get to this time frame, and God says it's too late. But there is a point out there where it is too late. And the idea of just putting it off and I'll get to it and I'll get around to it and I'll take care of uh, things later and all that, you, you don't know when the time comes where it's too late. I watched a video today and, and I ha we ended up having to, uh, to watch this video for a different reason that had to do with security and, and some other things. But uh, you all may have seen this not too long ago, and I don't remember, I want to think it was in Chicago, uh, but this happened literally, I think, over the weekend, where a guy gets out of the car to check his wife, who they've taken out, and uh, either beaten or killed, whatever's happened to and this guy's looking over her, and a guy comes up behind and puts two shots into the back, into his back and kills him. And of course, part of what that training was that we went through was to make sure to, to, no, uh, to notice your surroundings that even though there may be something traumatic happening in front, be aware that there could be other things that are happening that you need to be mindful of because you being dead over, on top of this person doesn't help this person. So you got to be mindful of all those things playing out. But I saw that and I thought to myself how evil and how wicked, but then it occurred to me there's no way this guy 
who's laying over his wife to see if she's okay or breathing away, thought for one second he was going to get shot in the back and die right there. Now, what if that is someone, let's say in our church this coming Sunday, that's dealing with the Lord, the Lord's telling this person they need to be saved, they say, I'll take care of business later, I'll procrastinate, put it off, and they go down to the food city down here to get gasoline, and they pull in there, and all of a sudden that scene play out, and they end up getting shot, and they die right there before they ever took the time or had the time to say, God, I'm sorry, would you forgive me of my sins? Would you say? We don't know how our time's coming, when our time's coming, or what may be out there in front of us. We only know what God has given us right now, this moment. And what God has given us time and time and time again is opportunity to turn to Him and to then go down the road and no longer have that opportunity or that chance. You can't sit there and blame God for that. How do you sit there and account for the fact, well, wait a minute, what did you just have? You had the opportunity to accept Christ. And when we look at this passage of Scripture, these people have already lived through three and a half years of the tribulation, and God has given them warning after warning after warning. He's delayed his wrath for mercy and for grace. We see people that are coming to know Jesus and asking him to forgive them of sin. We see all of that playing out in that first three and a half years. And now we're coming to a point where God says, okay, I have given you enough time, and now it's time for my wrath. Interesting thing about that is this. We don't know what day even during the tribulation that day is. It says three and a half years, but is that exactly three and a half years? And let's say even we know the day. We sure don't know the hour. Is it going to be at noon? Is it going to be at one? Is it going to be at three? Is it going to be at five? When is God going to say now? We don't know, do we? And everything that we need to come to grips with in an understanding is this. God's time for repentance is always now. It's never tomorrow. It's never next week. It's never in the next 30 minutes. It is now. I want to I want to go back to this, and, and I want to touch on one other thing, and then if you've got something to share, I, I certainly want you to share it, and, and um, certainly we want you to have the time to do that. But I want you to notice that in verse 2 it says, And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark, listen to this, and over the number of his name. Now, what's the number? The number of his name. What's the number? 666. What, is the num what does that number represent? The number of man. The number of man. And I want you to know that you know who seems to be our greatest enemy? Me. I am my greatest enemy in my walk for Christ. I'll wait on her for just a moment. That way we can all embarrass her. <laughs> so, I have found that the biggest obstacle, obstacle in my Christian walk is myself. I can convince myself that I'm okay when I'm not. I can convince myself that I've really got things under control. When really and truly, I don't. I can sit there and make myself believe that I'm right where God wants me while all the time lying to myself knowing I'm really not where God wants me at all. I'm the biggest obstacle in my Christian walk. And when we think about this mark, uh, the, the number of man being six, the 666, we, we live in a world that says, humanity, that humans are, are in control of their own destiny, that it's all about you and all those things and, and, and so we live in that humanistic world that really puts humans all the way at the top. But remember what we said about, uh, about the number six, if we took it all the way out to infinity, that it can never be, a six can never be a seven. Meaning, I can never be complete or whole without God. I can't get there 
God does something that is amazing. And I don't want you to ever forget this. This is the miracle of God. God takes me as a human, a six, puts Jesus Christ into my heart, and immediately I do become a seven. You say, Tim, what do you mean? You mean I become God? No, I don't mean that. I become complete. I become whole. I become solid. Because he who lives in me finishes out that one little spot that I can't quite get to, I can't quite measure up to, that one shortness of, 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 of characteristic that I don't seem to have the ability to get, Jesus is able to put that within me to make me complete, a whole, complete person. And all that's missing is Jesus in my life. And when I read that passage of Scripture and when I see that, that jumps off the page at me because that is what we teach every single day. Sunday. Every single Sunday, we're telling people, you may think you're where you need to be. You may feel like that you've got it under control. You may feel like everything's going to be fine. But the reality is, your sin in your life is always going to make you short of completeness. And the only way you can become complete is to get rid of that which is sinful in your life, which means you've got to replace it with something, which means you replace it with Jesus Christ and his forgiveness and his grace and his mercy. And it's that forgiveness, that grace, that mercy, the asking Jesus to come into one's heart and to save them, that, that saving grace is what makes you whole and complete and turns you from a six to a seven. And my challenge to you tonight is this. As we're reading this passage of Scripture, if Jesus comes back tonight, there's no doubt somebody that you know that is lost, that God's already put on your heart, that says you need to reach out to this person, you need to talk to them, you need to share uh, my, my love and grace with them now while there's time because you're going to be gone and they're not going to hear it from anywhere else. Now's the time to reach out to this person. But there's going to be someone that you know. If Jesus comes tonight, there's somebody that God's already laid on your heart that if Jesus were to come tonight and you were to be raptured out of, uh, out of uh, the earth and they're left here, they're going to go through this tribulation period. And it may be they never, ever, ever accept Christ. And three and a half years from now, they could be one of those that receives the wrath of God. And it could be somebody that you love with all of your heart. I say that so that you'll take it serious, but I also say that to challenge other Christians. You know, you know Christians in your life as well. And maybe there's a Christian out there that, that all of a sudden God's put on your heart to say, hey, you need to share this with them to help them get serious about serving God and being active in reaching lost people. Because here's what else I know. As much as I would love to reach every single friend of Gary's and bring them to this church and invite them to this church and lead them to Christ. I don't know every one of Gary's friends. Only Gary knows Gary's friends, right? So who do you think those folks are going to listen to? Me, who they don't know, or Gary, who they do? So our challenge is this. We need to challenge one another and challenge each other and challenge our family, our friends, our neighbors, that if they're a Christian, that they go and they reach lost people for Christ, but if they're lost, that they come and receive him today so that they're not spending an eternity in hell and they're not experiencing the wrath of God simply because I failed to do my part of reaching them for Jesus. Anyone got anything else they want to add to, to this uh, passage of Scripture that we read tonight? And by the way, uh, as we get into 16s, this is going to start unfolding and it's going to make sense what Brother Eddie was saying. What you're looking at right now in verse 15 is one of those, I'm going to use a synoptics, if that's what the word is, a, a synopsis or whatever. I call it the cliff notes. Basically, I just opened verse 15 and I read the cliff notes that says, if I go read the book, it's going to have this stuff, but you better go read the book because there's so much more in it. Um, and if you've ever had a teacher that knows how to read cliff notes, none of the questions on the test ever, ever, ever got answered in cliff notes. Uh, and they made sure of it so that you'd have to go read the story. The story is what we need to be reading because the story tells us so much more about what God's doing and there's reasons for it and there's justifications for it. 
and all the other things which as Christians literally ought to cause us to be proud that, that God has been so patient, so long-suffering for so long, and yet even in the midst of his judgment and in the midst of his wrath, you still see righteousness pouring out, and we'll see that. But anyone got anything they want to add? If not, Brother Eric, if everyone would stand, Brother Eric, would you dismiss us with a word of prayer tonight?